Gabby Friedson, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. I first heard you being interviewed on Jack Carr's uh, Danger Close podcast. And I was thinking to myself, man, this is such a cool story. And there's so many twists and turns and really neat stuff going on here that if I ever had a podcast and I was thinking about it, and lo and behold, here I am, I need to have you as a guest. So thanks for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm glad you got to first hear about me through Jack Carr. He is the man. I highly recommend everybody listening to him as his uh, new book just came out in the blood and his yes. prime series of the terminalist gets released on Amazon prime uh, next month. Yeah. He was a guest of mine on the show ooh, two, three, four weeks ago, somewhere in that ballpark. Great guy. So down to earth and boy, he's been through a lot and he's just, he's so grounded and such a nice guy, just a genuinely nice person. Yes, especially, you know, just meeting a person who was a 20-year Navy SEAL sniper. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, what a humble personality and, and yep. a talented writer. Yes. So, uh, you know, coming out of Memorial Weekend, just um, really, I was walking around Arlington Cemetery with my wife, just putting some flowers down on graves, and it really just makes you really take a moment to really just understand the magnitude and the, the greatness of sacrifice and for people who serve their country. Absolutely. So I wanted to start out the uh, interview <laughs> with a story. Uh, I, I don't know if it was on Jack's podcast or where I heard it, but you delivered your math teacher's baby <laughs> when you were 15 <laughs> years old. Tell us about that. I love how that story gets uh, so much attention. <laughs> I guess it's not everybody who gets to have that experience in life. Um, no. Let me tell you, you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Well, well take it back a little bit the reason I was in Israel at the time you know obviously I uh, I was born in the United States I moved my family to Israel when I was 10 years old and uh, at the age of 15 I started volunteering with the emergency rescue services in Israel where you can do that we can talk about that a little later of what life mm -hmm. like that is in, in Israel um, but just riding on the back of the ambulance being a first aid responder and um, just me and the ambulance driver responding to an emergency uh, of a woman who was you know pregnant water broke and uh, going into labor, and uh, I arrived, and out of coincidence, it happened to be my math teacher at the time. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Smith. Uh, it, any pop quizzes coming up? You know? <laughs> oh my gosh, let me tell you. First of all, um, as I, I joke with everybody now, is I have the best excuse of why I'm really bad at math, um, <laughs> or, or why I don't like math. Um, but yes, a lot of nightmares ever since <laughs> i would you know, think that'd be not, pretty traumatizing to a 15 year old i would i would guess you know, it's not the terrorist attacks that i've responded to it's delivering my math teacher's baby <laughs> so oh that's funny did you was the baby like actually born like in the back of the ambulance or it was it was at the hospital like okay. we to get her to the hospital but like just having to like transport her and then on our on our stretcher and really just like do everything oh my gosh it was just very awkward yeah that, that would be definitely would be oh my gosh yeah i'm thinking about where i was when i was 15 years old i was a punk ass kid you know i i've, I've been high school getting average grades smoking cigarettes drinking jack daniels you know and just being a, just a punk more or less then i turned 16 then my dad's like okay you have to get a job and I'm like yeah well that's the beauty of israel right that's where this country really just steps up to the plate you know and at a very young age um kids are forced to mature earlier uh, you're able to give back. You're able to volunteer on an ambulance at 16 on a fire department, you know, on a fire truck. Really? 17 at the police department. You can be a volunteer police officer. And 18, you know, two weeks after high school, I was already drafted to the mandatory military service. Right. We'll so, talk about that later at length. Sure. I like that. Um, but at 15 years old, you know, you're a volunteer, like, medic. Is there training for that at school? Is everybody getting, like, some kind of, like, trade craft like that? Or did you have to go out and search for it? Well, in ninth and 10th grade, you have to do a mandatory extracurricular activity of some sort. You know, it could be a soup kitchen. You can volunteer with, you know, an old person's home. You can mm -hmm. really do a lot of different things. But at 15 years old, I think it's between ninth and 10th grade, you can already start taking the course in the summer vacation. Um, and the National Ambulance Service offers that course. And you can start volunteering on the back of the ambulance and after school once a week uh, from either three to 10 or whatever that shift is, you can literally be on the back of an ambulance with the ambulance driver who's an EMT or a paramedic. And um, you are the medic in the back of the ambulance and you're responding to every emergency that an ambulance would respond to. Wow. And 
it really just it, it's an amazing amazing sense of not only just giving back to your community but but volunteering and and opens your eyes to just the real world oh yeah um, absolutely I loved every moment of it. I mean, it's supposed to be once a week, but you know, obviously you could do more shifts. And then I was one of those kids at the time that kind of almost wanted to do it every day after school. And my parents were even joking with me that like throughout high school, I was either going to school or coming home from school in either a fire truck or an ambulance. <laughs> like I knew everybody, right? Like ambulance drivers, a fire department. If I was just walking in the street, I'd wave to them. Like it would just become, you know, you come so close to your first responder community. Um, but especially at such a young age. And when I was there, it was towards the end of the second intifada when there were still buses blowing up and terrorist attacks uh, going on in Israel. And, um, you know, to have to see that and witness that at such a young age, I think also was, uh, you know, a huge reason for just, you know, being forced to mature at a much younger age than, than other teenagers. Yeah, I would think so. Holy cow. You know, like I said before, just thinking about where I was at 15, I, I wasn't even close to that kind of life experience. And here you are doing this. Now, were you living in Jerusalem at the time? I was. Okay. Now, do they have the same type of opportunities for people who live in like more rural or less urban areas? Yeah. The whole country. You can volunteer anywhere in the whole country from north to south. I mean, uh, Israel is only the size of about New Jersey, right? To give it, okay. put into context. It's about the size of New Jersey with about 9 million people. I mean, right? Um, north to south. So you can drive the whole country in almost like seven hours. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So it's pretty densely populated, I would assume. Yes. Okay. So you were born in Florida, like you said, why did your family and yourself obviously immigrate to Israel? And yeah, why did you, and when exactly did you do that? Great question. Well, well, in 1999, um, my parents who run an American news agency based out of now it's based out of Israel, but at the time, you know, they really wanted to cover the Middle East a little bit closer. Mm. And um, they were always flying back and forth. And I think just a sense of um, being closer, you know, apparently there's a conflict in that region. So it made sense to be where all the action's at. And um, just living in the United States, I think uh, there was just a calling to move to Israel and, and live there. And uh, there's a lot of Americans that live there. Um, and it's a great place to grow up. It's a great place. To, uh, I enjoyed every minute of it. I really did. I mean, obviously there's tough times anywhere you are and, and there's stressful times and, and you right. know, uncertainty. Um, when you look back at it, when you're older, you just realize what a blessing it was and when, when a smart decision on, 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 on their behalf. Um, and you really cherish it um, as you get older. You know, when you're a kid, you're not really understanding anything at the time. So that was like, <laughs> right. cool. You know, Did, I was 10 years old missing my, I was going to miss my dog. We had an American Eskimo we had to say oh, goodbye to. Oh, that's too bad. Um, but yeah, it was just, when you look back, it was just the best decision. Now, did you have brothers and sisters? I have two older brothers and they moved, we all moved together. Nobody ran away. You know, okay. we all went as a family and my brothers, you know, two years after that were immediately enlisted in the military. One was a tank commander and the other one served in the artillery, uh, in artillery unit. Wow. So you get pulled from an, a Florida school and now you're in Jerusalem. How different was that? Could you kind of paint a picture of what school was like when you landed and you started school there? Sure. Well, first of all, every school in Israel kind of looks like a jail. You know, <laughs> it's like, I mean, honestly, looking again, looking back at it now, I was always so jealous because you look at the high schools here and there's like large, you know, soccer fields and football fields and there's like this culture of like teams and sports mm -hmm. and there's more about, you know, it's not a huge infrastructure. There's tons of security around it. There's one solid entrance. There's a security guard at every school. And that's the reason for it also is the security aspects. Um, you know, we, we're not dealing with school shootings there. We're not dealing with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people coming in and, and harming children. Uh, we take our security very seriously. And also in terms, I'm sure of budget, uh, of even having the capability or the space to have such a large, you know, infrastructure, but the schools are different. Um, it's much more, you know, focused on education uh, than kind of like after school curriculum. Like you'll see, like here we have ROTC and bands and, and all these other things, you know, there you kind of finish your class, you finish your work, and then you kind of can go volunteer, you know, out of school uh, premises. And that's where, you know, that's where at 15, I was already volunteering with the local national ambulance service. Yeah. So you had to learn Hebrew as well, or was Hebrew the, the main language? 
to the main language. And it took about almost, I mean, for me, being only 10 years old, you know, and it's true, when you're a child, it's a lot easier to, to learn a language. And I was able to do that. It took about almost two years, I think, to become fluent in Hebrew. Uh, my brother's a little bit longer, but by the end of, you know, a couple of years, they also now speak fluent Hebrew. Um, and we also, we, I've lived there for almost 20 years before coming back to the United States. So, you know, you're in school, you're a 10 year old kid, you don't know anybody, you know, you're the new guy and you, you don't speak the language. So you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. They're going to see you as an American, right? Yeah. So they did. And there were a lot of questions, you know, a lot of, you know, I had a couple of Ethiopian kids in my class that were just like, they just loved the fact um, that I came from America and like, you know, where I came from and I came from Florida at the time. And, you know, they were just like, to them, you know, they just love, it just depends, right? Like each, yeah. each kid um, soaked it up in a different way. Right. Um, I, 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 the first school I went to was not great. I did not enjoy that there. It was like, they were, they were not the best of the best. Okay. Um, a year after that, there was like, a, apparently my parents, you know, did a lot of research for which school I should go to. This was like the best school, you know, for elementary school but it was actually this principal who had such an amazing, you know, reputation and, and name, but was retiring that year. And I think, you know, how you have that, that saying of where, you know, it's uh, they're kind of like calling it quits before, <laughs> you know, um, they retired on active duty. I get it. Correct. And okay. um, that year was just not one of the best years, but I switched schools after that. And I stayed at that other school f- throughout my entire high school. I just loved it. The kids were great. The teachers were great. The support system. That's where I really got to mm-hmm. learn Hebrew um, and uh, just amazing people. Like, I mean, I'm very, very, very lucky to have had a great high school experience. So what was it like there? You know, I've never been there. I have friends that have been to Israel and they sing its praises. They said it's just a beautiful country. You know, the beaches are supposed to be incredible. You know, you're on the Mediterranean. And I've seen a couple of, like, oh, uh, commercials on TV for travel, you know, like to Israel. And they show, like, the nightlife. And, you know, there's these, you know, gorgeous women, you know, and cocktail parties and, you know, pool parties and, you know, whatever. What was it like? You know, I, I, think, I think to myself, it's like, you're in a constant state of war. What I, do you just not even notice that or what's it like? No, you don't notice it. I mean, you can notice it if you want to, but I think most Israelis just want to go about their everyday life. And and like you said, it is a gorgeous country Um, from North to South. The weather's amazing. Um, It can get hot in the summer, but you know, it usually doesn't rain for half the year. And uh, it's a beautiful place. I mean, if you're in Jerusalem, you get to see the old city, um, and go back 3000 years, you get to walk around, you know, the Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, the Jewish quarter, you know, everyone has some sort of connection sure. uh, to the land, to the country, to its people, um, to the culture, the food is unbelievable. I mean, so fresh, really, really. I mean, I'm very fortunate that I get to travel a lot for work and all around the world, but there's just, uh, there's nothing like the walking through a Jerusalem or Tel Aviv or just an open market, um, and experiencing that vibe of uh, everyone selling fresh produce and, and the food is just amazing. You always know which Jewish holidays are on the corner based on what kind of fruits and vegetables are being served that weekend. Oh, okay. Um, it's very special. I mean, people, Israelis take a lot of pride in their country. Obviously, like any other place, there's a lot of its own issues that they have, especially, mm-hmm. you know, with what the world's experiencing lately with, uh, you know, the rise in real estate by 16% just this oh, year. Sure. And, you know, the discrepancies of, you know, economy and, you know, people who aren't in the high tech world where they're, you know, over a million and a half people in poverty. I mean, there are specific, you know, and certain issues that clearly, like any other country they have and they're dealing with. Um, but in general, uh, I, I highly recommend putting it on your bucket list of, of places to go and places to see and spend at least 10 days there. Um, you can do so much. You can go skiing up north you know on the syrian border oh, and then wow. you can go downtown seven hours and you know be down in the dead sea you can be floating in the dead sea and they can be down in a lot in the red sea and you can be hanging out um you know you can be climbing masada the mountains there's just there's no shortage of things to do and the people are very welcoming yeah so very where's friendly. the Where's the best beaches? I, I love to go to the beach. I know I'm a pretty well, pale all, Irish guy, but I really love the beach. With, starting with Tel Aviv, I think. Okay. Great nightlife there. 
and Tel Aviv. Um, I think you'll get a kick out of seeing all these, you know, um, just you'll see a lot of tourists, but you'll also see a lot of local Israelis who sure um, just enjoy going to the beach and then they go to work or, you know, they, they, some of them come in a bathing suit right after work. And <laughs> no, that's the light. That, I like that. That's on the bay, right. And then you have high rise office buildings and then right literally on the, on the, on the boardwalk. Yeah. Um, and then you're watching the sunset and it's a great way to just have a cold beer as you're just overlooking the Mediterranean. Sometimes you'll see some uh, female soldiers in their bikinis with their rifles, which is a rare sight. <laughs> you know? Oh but my! I, I mean, a lot, a lot of people get a kick out of that. It's not every day you see that. No, not every day you see that. Nope. You, no, but it reminds you of of just you know the constant I think threat that Israelis live under, um, whether it's you know a, a terrorist attack or when things act up in Gaza from our cousins next door. And yeah. they decide to shoot rockets and you never know when that's going to be. Um, so yeah, let me, it's just, it's let me ask you this. When you were a kid, you know, you're fresh from America. Did you ever feel unsafe? I mean, did you endure any kind of like rocket attacks or like that kind of thing? Is it, as yeah, a I've been through person? a lot of them. I've been through a lot of the rocket attacks. Um, I even so, went back last year, last May, exactly a year ago when we had that week of rockets raining down on Israel. I went and joined my fellow medics with United at Sela. And spent a few nights in our um, bomb shelter uh, with an armored vest and helmet and medical equipment. And we only have about 10 seconds to find shelter uh, once the siren wow. goes out. There's not actually, there's no siren where we are. Like we're so close to the border of where they're shooting it. You have it just, there's an air raid system that just says red alert, red alert, red alert. And you have 10 seconds to um, get your six into a shelter or just lie on the floor, put your hands over your head and, you know, hope the debris, if it hits, flies yeah. over you. So um, I, I was there responding to homes that were directly hit that were not intercepted from the Iron Dome. Wow. So, I mean, do you get like a text message? How does that happen? No, no, you're just in your, you are, I mean, during that week when thousands of rockets were raining down, you, the whole country, the side, depending where the rocket is launched towards, we're very fortunate to have the Iron Dome system and, and have the technology uh, that can warn civilians to find shelter and have those two minutes which have saved a lot of many many lives of being able to have that advance notice that a rocket is on its way wow okay so you know you started your training for medical stuff when you were 15 years old and that was like an extracurricular for school and you had like the mandatory volunteering for that when you were in school now you steered towards the medical side was there family members or mentors that kind of push you in that direction or how did that work? I was just walking. Well, a few things actually, yes to the family, but first, you know, I was walking, you know, to Jerusalem. It's a very, you know, where I lived was about 10 minute walk to the main downtown area. And I remember walking one day after school, just walking home, getting ice cream. And I, I saw a traffic accident and I saw the ambulance crew, you know, show up to the call. And I was like, wow, that, that crew looks really young. Like, how old are they? And like, that kind of inspired me. Like, I want to do what they're doing. And also my grandfather, who served as a doctor with the American army in, you know, World oh. War II, one of okay. the first, one of the first soldiers to actually liberate Dachau concentration camp. Wow. Um, and that kind of inspired his move to Israel. And my grandmother, who just turned 100 years old, she's still there. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so I have a lot of family in Israel. And I just think, you know, I really wanted to do something that would also connect me to society in Israel. And I thought there's no better way than actually being a first responder, being a medic, getting to ride the ambulances and treat, you know, all sorts of people. And I did the course in the summer. I passed it. I got to meet great instructors, great fellow colleagues, medics, uh, school like students from other schools. And it just became this like almost like a summer camp where you have a group of friends, you know, that you could be friends with your school friends, your summer camp friends, and then you <laughs> become friends with your first responder friends. And um, until today, I'm still really, really good friends with a lot of them. Oh, that's and nice. being on the back of the ambulance was an amazing opportunity because it kind of is what got me into the role I am today and in the organization that I am with right now. Um, and I've been with for so long because I believe in it. I believe in everything it does um, in saving lives the way we do. And, and we'll get into that as well. Yeah. Now in Israel, when you graduate from high school, there is a mandatory, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's a mandatory uh, service that you have to do. 
Now, is this purely military, or is there any other ways you can volunteer, or not volunteer, but you're voluntold? You know, it's a mandatory thing. What does that look like? Yeah, you have to do a mandatory um, military service or uh, social service, and where you're giving back to your country in some sort of way, whether it's you know civilly. There's a lot of people who volunteer either um, do their civil service through becoming a nurse at, at a hospital or just volunteering in administrative uh, capacity, or if you're not going to do the military route. I mean, the majority of people usually sign up and have to, have to go to the military. Uh, 18 years old, men have to do almost three years and, and, and women have to do about two. Um, and they're always talking about reducing the time. But when I was in the army, it was three years for men, two years for women. Um, Are you getting paid when you're doing all this? You get paid, but I wouldn't call that a paycheck. I mean, oh, okay, so it's I mean, a diminished paycheck. You get about. I was in combat, and I got maybe seven hundred dollars a month. Okay, but you got three hots and a cop when you're not in combat. Yeah, but it's okay. different. The Israeli military again, it's such a small country. It's not like in the United States when you get you you know sign up for service, which is volunteer, but you volunteer for your service, and you can be deployed for six months to a year before you come home. Uh, in Israel, right. you can come home. Some people come home every day. Some come home every weekend in infantry wow. or other units, you know, in combat, you can come home maybe every three weeks, maybe a month, but you're not going to go more than six weeks, not being home and doing your laundry and having a home cooked meal. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. That, that is different. That is but, for sure. But it also puts into context of the war we're fighting, right? We're, we're on the front lines. It's not like you can just, you know, you're, you're thousands of miles away and you have this luxury of, um, being somewhere that's so far away, but you're, you're literally your boots, you're standing on the ground of what you're protecting. You're looking behind you, even when you're, you know, at war and you can see the communities you're protecting. Mm. So it just really puts a lot of emphasis into your, your you know, encouragement of, of reminder of what you're doing as you're spending those long days and hours and exhausted protecting your country. Right. So, you know, as far as the mandatory service, what are the pros and the cons do you think for that? The pros are it gives a tremendous um, sense of responsibility and pride in your country, something that I really wish the United States had some sort of volunteer service after high school uh, before they go off to college uh, and have four amazing years of drinking and partying. Um, <laughs> they did even six months, just something to just something, kind of yeah. something to just connect them to, to responsibility to the sense of sacrifice, the sense of, you know, how great this country is um, and understanding, you know, that it takes people to step up to the plate and really, you know, uh, I, I mean, I, I really believe that having a mandatory service or just even if there were incentives to help them with college tuition, you know, instead mm -hmm. of just you know, handing out a $10,000 check to stay up, no more student loans, Maybe go and volunteer for three months at a hospital or do something that, that you earn that $10,000, but also earn that sense of pride in your country. Um, I was just speaking the other day at a high school and half the kids didn't even know the Pledge of Allegiance. And it really gets you thinking about like, where, where is this country? Where's the United States going to be, you know, when their priorities are just have been shifting in this, in this current generation? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I don't think everybody is a right fit for the military. I don't believe in a draft per se, because not everybody makes a good soldier. It just doesn't work out that way. Right. And, but like you said before, you could volunteer at a hospital. You, I mean, you could work at a hospital. You could, there's social stuff that you could do that would fulfill that. And if you're doing that for two years and you're not, in your comfort zone per se, you know, if you're a soldier or what, whatever the case may be, you're going to mature really fast and you're going to go into college at this different level of maturity. Like most people I talk to, including I took a year off between college and high school. I worked two full-time jobs and then I, I went and go visit my buddies that were in college. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> They're off having fun and, you know, drinking and partying and, you know, doing college person stuff. And here I am working all the time and I'm like, well, that's kind of stupid. Why am I doing that for? So I quit one of my full-time jobs and, you know, I went to college full-time and I worked full-time, but I 
I wasn't even ready yet after one year, to tell you the truth. I don't think I had the maturity for it, and my grades showed it. And then as I got a little bit older, you know, I'm like, ooh, I got to take this seriously. And my grades got a lot better. And you'd see people that were in the military or they did something else and they went to college a couple of years later, their grades were a lot better and they took it a lot more seriously. So I, I that's where I see it too. Yeah. And let me tell you, it does mess with your head a little bit. Like I'm not going to say, you know, when I was 18 and, you know, in basic training and, you know, you're seeing back then I didn't really have as much social media as they have today. Right. I can't even imagine what the soldiers have today with, the, you know, their Instagrams and TikToks and seeing yeah. everyone else partying when you're like, <laughs> you know, doing a field training week and uh, literally eating dirt. Um, it did, but you only, again, when you're older and you look back at the experience, you realize how it is actually a blessing and how, how much it actually um, was a good thing. And a lot of people don't get that experience. I mean, most Israelis do get the experience. And I think that's why the country is really just a, a very special place as, as a people. They all understand the importance of it and the importance of, uh, of responsibility giving back and stepping up to the plate. Now, it, when you were, um, you did your two years, it was two years, three years? I forgot. Three years. Was, three years. Three. When you did your three years, were you like a combat medic? Were you in the medical field or were you doing something yeah, different? I was, I started in a, a combat infantry unit and then I was later, um, I was later transferred from a combat infantry unit after a knee injury to the IDF spokesperson's unit where I served as a spokesperson for the international media. Oh, okay. Very cool. All right. So let's switch gears here and start talking about what you're doing now. You know, I, I'm a big motorcycle guy. I love motorcycles. I've been riding this since I was like 16 years old. Wow. And, you know, I had an older brother that always had not so nice bikes. <laughs> you know, they're barely running, but I thought it was cool. So I'd steal the keys when he wasn't around and take off on his motorcycle. That's, that's how I learned how to ride a bike. <laughs> like a dummy you know and kids you know go off and take one of those rider safety courses i can't tell you i wish i would have done that at a young age that makes total sense but you know you are working well volunteering with the united hatzla of israel correct yes okay with united, well at the time i was with an the national ambulance service and then okay. i felt the same frustrations that the founder of the organization felt where ambulances are a great method in terms of transportation, but they're not so amazing in terms of the first response aspect of getting there in those first critical minutes where a person's choking or a person's bleeding, or, you know, you need to start CPR and the ambulance crew is stuck in traffic. So response time would be about 15, 20 minutes when you got to get there in those first three minutes. And uh, the founder of the organization, Ellie Beer, uh, who, who himself was a volunteer at 15 and rode the ambulances, was also very frustrated. And that's where the whole concept came, where he was on the way to an, a person who was choking and couldn't get there in time. And unfortunately, it was too late. But he would see these. Uh oh. Hello. In seconds and realizing, hey, we need to say, Bob, oh, you're, you're, you're freezing up. The concept of ambulance. Oh, I'm freezing up. Yeah, you're freezing up. Um, hmm. Yeah. Why, why don't we just take it from, yeah, your picture is still frozen. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yep, sure can. Yep, you bet. So I started volunteering on the back of the ambulance at 15. And just like the founder of the organization, United Hatsala, uh, he was volunteering at the age of 15 as well, just you know, a couple of years ahead of me. Um, if not a little more than a couple, <laughs> but okay. he had the same sense of frustration when he was responding. And ambulances are a great method of transportation, but they're just not ideal for getting to a person who's choking or needs to mm -hmm. stop the bleed within those first three critical moments. And uh, in those first few minutes, 
And he realized when he was on the way to a call and the person didn't make it, he was very frustrated. But then he thought, like, why, why are we stuck in traffic while I watch these Pizza Hut and Domino motorcycles, you know, respond with pizza and get there within minutes? Why don't we kind of do the same thing? And, and we started instead of being relying on an ambulance model where you have an ambulance station and two ambulances can go. And what if they're both busy? We needed to kind of shift to a community emergency response uh, model where we train members of the community to respond. And we also created a new idea of, of a motorcycle ambulance, which we called an ambucycle. Okay. And this was his idea. And you're able to now have a motorcycle fully equipped with all the equipment that an ambulance has. The defibrillator, um, you know, the, the medical kits, the, anything that's in an ambulance except the stretcher would be in this motorcycle. Wow. In, in Israel, we have armored vests as well for any time we have to go to a terrorist attack or, or uh, any sort of trauma that's not safe for our, for our medics to respond to or any incident. But the fact is we're able to respond now to any emergency across Israel in three minutes or less. Wow. In, in most cases, even 90 seconds, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, main cities. Um, we have responders with almost 6,500 first responders going to any call within three minutes or less. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's the, it's the fastest response time in the world. And the beauty of it, it's, it's just, you know, 6,500 medics from all backgrounds, from all walks of life, Jews, Christians, Muslims, working, serving their communities, responding to fellow strangers. Um, and it's all volunteer. No one gets paid a dime to do it. It's wow. all volunteer. So, so really amazing. I, I live in Jerusalem. I'm having some type of medical emergency or a family member is, I dial 911 and it automatically will dispatch one of these Ambu cycles, like who's ever the closest, like an Uber driver kind of thing. Yeah, just like Uber, find, you nailed it. You know, just like finding the five closest drivers, we find the five closest medics, paramedics, EMTs, doctors. Um, and you just, if you're able to respond and, you know, you're at home and you have the, uh, the, the availability to get onto your motorcycle or your car and being able to respond is, is a, you know, not if you can't, then you'll just hit the button and it'll go to the next medic. And you wow. can also filter it out that like, if you're only available for mass casualties or mm. um, ALS, advanced life support, if somebody's you know, unconscious and needs CPR. Right. Um, but if you're available for anything else, then you'll, you know, you can help your neighbor who fell out of bed, who's maybe a hundred years old. There's like, you can really do anything. So we don't have a 911 number in Israel. That's a different topic that we're trying to figure out. Um, right now, there's separate numbers for the police, the fire, the EMS. Oh, there is. Okay. But we all work together. So no matter who you call, whether it's police, fire, EMS, we all get the call. We all respond. But our response time is definitely the fastest, getting there in those first three minutes. What's your relationship like with the the regular like firefighters or EMS that are that go to the same call? You know, is there any animosity there or is there any competition? Yeah, it's amazing. Or... Well, because again, it's such a small country, you know, you can go to synagogue, you know, or church or the mosque and like, you know, you're, you're all friends, right? You all know each other. Um, just because you volunteer with one organization or the other, you're all there to save lives. So it's sure. really a great, great um, environment, great partnership. We're all family. Um, and I think they respect us because, you know, the family in times of an emergency or a crisis or, or someone's choking, that's like eternity waiting for oh, yeah. to show that up. certainly is and if you have help arrive within those first three minutes that could just calm the room and, and really calm everybody down and they know help arrives rather than waiting for 15 minutes for the ambulance um i think they respect us they and they and we stay there our volunteers you know take every emergency they respond to and treat them like family of their own and they really help them from the beginning to the end there are so many cases where our medics have delivered babies and they had to stay and babysit because the parents had to go to the hospital and our medics just literally, <laughs> okay. yeah, they just stayed there with the family, yeah. clean up the blood or they do whatever they have to do to, to really, um, you know, help to the best they can. And, yeah. and again, all free of charge. We don't charge for any of our services from wow. the goodness of our hearts. That's amazing. Now, as far as the bikes that you ride, what are they? Um, They're kind of, they're, they're not heavy motorcycles. You know, it's not, I, can't, I don't want you to picture like it's some Harley Davidson, uh, yeah. you know, or <laughs> like a Yamaha. Ride, yeah. yeah. It's a Yamaha. It's a, uh, it's a 400 CC. We do have, we do have heavier bikes that, that can go and all terrain with ATVs and ambulances and drones mm -hmm. and boats. And there's about 500 drownings every year in Israel. Wow. Um, 
in the Mediterranean and the Sea of Galilee. So we do have two rescue boats as well. So we're able to respond. Uh, we think of everything. We really think of, you know, if anybody calls us and needs, needs medical attention, how can we get there within those first three minutes that matter most? And we think of the tools that our medics would need uh, in order to get there. So in terms of, you know, a desert terrain and off-road, that's why we have uh, ATVs that could do that. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, when I was looking at the picture, you know, it's that's a lot of gear on a smaller, like, uh, scooter-type, moped-type bike. And I'm thinking to myself right away, I like the BMW Adventure bikes. Yeah. You know, you can put a lot of stuff on those. They have those, like, hard um, bags. Or even Harley-Davidson now has the Pan, the Pan Ams. Mm-hmm. And I saw one of those up close, and I'm like, holy cow, that is it's badass. That's a nice bike. And you could rig it up where you could fit all kinds of stuff. And man, you could get through almost anything with those bikes. Yeah, we do. And paramedics have all the medical, you know, uh, medicine that they need in order to start a CPR, just as if you were in a hospital. Yeah. All the medications, um, birth kits, you know, all the gauze pads, all the pressure bandages. Um, they also have like all the, uh, the meds. All the meds. Okay. Literally everything except the stretcher. And again, our, our primary um, goal is to respond to an emergency and be the first of the first responders. We get there within those first moments that, that matter most, stabilize the patient. So by the time an ambulance arrives, the person is stabilized and ready for transport, significantly increasing the time of survival. So instead of waiting 15, 20 minutes and only getting there and starting to pull out the stretcher and starting to assess the situation, the situation has already been assessed uh, vitals have been taken, mm-hmm. bleeding has been stopped, medics have already started CPR, we've done what we need to, to do in order to uh, get that person safely and, and, and ready for transport. Now, in larger cities like where I worked, sometimes, you know, it would be the fire department that would get called to a trauma, you know, like a shooting or some kind of, you know, stabbing or whatever, and they would be staging, you know, like a block or two down before we would deem the safe the area safe. Now, do you guys just go in because you're armed, correct? And you're wearing vests? Um, a lot of our medics are armed just due to the situation in Israel. And a lot of first responders, you know, we get there so fast, even before the police and a lot of these terrorist attacks. Yeah. We are, you know, our medics, not only are they, are they risking their lives in, in terms of through red lights and uh, intersections at yeah, night. Right, at night, absolutely. It, um, getting to a... A terrorist attack where you don't know an active shooter case and incident and being able to get off the motorcycle and start treating people and not knowing what's going on but our medics do have um do have firearms and they're all trained and we make sure they're trained and they do what they need to do to to save lives what do they carry oh it's a mix i'd say the majority either a glock a glock or a sig okay gotcha that's probably the most popular firearm in Israel. Sure. Or the sure. Masada, your IWI. Gotcha. That makes total sense to me. All right. Uh, you know, I read a book. It was called Tribe by Sebastian Younger. Have you ever read that book? No. It's pretty good. He was a war reporter. And, you know, he literally was in Afghanistan. He was in Afghanistan. And he literally, like, the soldier that was, like, right by him blew up. You know, and when he came out of all that, he had a very healthy dose or case, excuse me, of PTSD. Now, he was talking about how in Israel, the instances of PTSD are remarkably low, especially in the military. Yeah, you know, this is a country that's in a constant state of war. You have mandatory, you know, service, you know, to be in the army, and you have the terrorist stuff going on. You have all this but you have such a low PTSD numbers. How does that happen? I think it has to do, you know, it's a great question. And I, and it would be a great study, but I do think it has to do with what we started speaking about in terms of responsibility and kids growing up under this threat and, and understanding the importance of survival and what it means to serve your country. Um, And, you know, for better or for worse, it's just reality. And, you know, kids there are are um, exposed to the reality of the world and what it takes to exist and to fight for your country uh, and for freedom 
and I think it has a lot to do with it. United had Sala, our organization, um, stepped up to the plate in terms of PTSD and mental health because we are the first organization, medical first response organization that implemented an actual division that is strictly responsible for uh, helping prevent PTSD and helping mental health of uh, those that are physically, not just physically wounded, but actually mentally affected by some sort of terrorist attack or any kind of trauma, as well as helping our first responders who are exposed to it. And our medics from the psychotrauma unit have already been to Surfside Miami when the building collapsed there to help with the local police department and first responders and military. They've helped um, in Ukraine, we've had over 40 airplanes, by the way, that have helped evacuate over 4,000 refugees. We're the first medical international organization to have a field hospital wow. on the border of Ukraine and Moldova. Yeah. We've really taken this whole concept of just saving lives in Israel um, globally. And our experience um, is what has made a great name for us just because we find the best of the best volunteers. And we, we just want to do our job. We don't care about the recognition. We just want to get there in those first few minutes that matter most and save lives. And, you know, throughout the years since we've started, uh, there's so many international disasters that we've been a part of because other countries call on us because they recognize us and they know how professional we are and, and how good we are at our job. Now, you're, you've been with United Hatzla for how long? I'd say I'm one of the first hundred medics. I mean, it really started in, from the beginning years. Um so how about how many years is that? So they started 2006. Okay. And um, I started um, a little after that. Okay. And then I was a volunteer uh, for many years. I still volunteer every time I'm back in Israel, even though I'm flying back and forth a lot these days. Um, whenever I'm there, I do an ambulance shift, get back on the back of the ambu cycle and respond to calls. Cool. Uh, full time right now, I'm in the United States, uh, serving as our global ambassador and director of international emergency management and uh, helping spread the word and, and developing, you know, the, the relationships for more resources that we can continue to do our job in Israel. Sure. You know, I worked in a city that has congested streets where it was difficult for ambulances and fire trucks to make it through these very narrow, you know, roads. And again, you know, the human population, you know, you, you always contended with that. But I'm thinking like New York, Chicago, L.A., Miami, you know, where this would be a huge benefit. How has it been when you're trying to present that to these different departments or cities, this idea? it's It's been good, but the United States, is, it's complex in terms of the red tape, I'd say, the bureaucracy with, you know, just the unions. Um, for some reason, the, you know, the unions are very anti-volunteer. You know, they think sure. the volunteer comes in and, and that's it. That's taking someone's salary. And it's not the case. Like we, we have no interest, at least for us, like we just want to get there first. We just want to be able to help somebody because we understand that there's a, a problem with the response time. And I, I'm, I've yet to meet one off-duty first responder, a firefighter, a cop who knows that his neighbor is or friend or anybody in the building is, you know, choking or in need of help and won't respond. Um and it's not about, you know, a different salary or taking money because we don't, you know, I've, I've responded to thousands of emergencies and I've never received a, a penny in compensation. Mm -hmm. Literally just understanding of how important it is to get there in those first three minutes. And the ambulance is going to come and the ambulance is going to still bill them and they'll bill their insurance. Right. Yeah. I just, it kind of baffles me because it just sounds like such a good idea, especially in climates that are a little bit warmer, you know, Milwaukee, <laughs> like right. nine months out of the year, there's a whole lot of snow and cold. And I don't know yeah, how I mean, plausible that would be. But you can at least have first responders in their cars go. And in rural areas like in Iowa or Wisconsin or other yeah. places where just, you know, you have one ambulance. And what if that ambulance is busy at, a, you know, an MVC and motor, motor vehicle, you know, uh, crash. crash somewhere. Right. And if they're dealing with that and there's a pile up somewhere and then you don't have somebody to take care of someone who's, you know, have cardiac arrest. Um, so we just kind of think out of the box in terms of our response. Hmm. Getting yeah, in the first it, three minutes. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense to me. And like I said before, maybe in a little bit better climate. But <laughs> yeah, that, that's unfortunate. Maybe, who knows, maybe you'll make some decent strides. Is it? Do you have this service with the moto ambulances in any other place in the world, or is it just in Israel? 
Um, we have, can I, if someone keeps uh, ringing my doorbell. Do you mind? Yeah, no, two- I'll pause it. So is there any other places in the world that actually has the service of like ambiocycles? There are other countries um, where I've seen, I think in Australia, um, where I've seen medical motorcycles, but not to the extent that, that we've created in Israel. Um, I think it's for some, maybe a field paramedic supervisor that has it like at, at certain events in the community, but not sure. the response level that we have where our motorcycles or ambucycles are responding every day to emergencies throughout the entire community, throughout the country, throughout the cities. Mm. Um, being able to get, you know, you can get five ambucycles on a call within three minutes. Yeah, that's um, amazing. We have a fleet, right? This right. is just uh, something very different. We have a chapter, you know, we had a chapter in Ukraine that had two ambulances that we worked with in terms of first response in those communities. And that's kind of what got us, you know, first on scene during the whole Ukraine invasion, being able gotcha. to respond there and set up the whole field hospitals because of our connection with Odessa and, and mm. uh, Kiev and, and Oman and three major cities in, in Ukraine. Right. Um, but in terms of other countries, you know, it's something that we are trying to explore. We want other countries to learn from us and mm-hmm. understand how successful it is to get there within those first moments that matter most those first few minutes and nobody should have to wait 20 minutes for an ambulance anywhere in the world right so what's the what's in the future for gabby how about a book i think you <laughs> you have a great story man i i think you'd you'd write a killer book oh my gosh let me tell you first of all i'm sure my, if my parents are listening to this or my wife they would say the same thing they've been trying to push me to do this for a long time yeah um, i wish i was more of a a, a good writer but it's, I have so much to say and, and, and you're right. You're, you're right. And maybe, maybe you finally, it's time to finally just sit down and do it. Um, I have a lot to share and a, an incredible experience. Again, just moving to Israel at such a young age and yes. forced um, to really grow up much faster than, than my peers and being exposed to things that, you know, some kids should probably never be exposed to, but no resentment. If anything, I'm grateful for it. I think it, it's given me this passion and this love of life of every single day is a blessing and to count your blessings and life is short mm-hmm. and um you know there's just so many curveballs that people are you know that's just life you know you get thrown a, you never know what you're gonna wake up to but right. there's just a way to look at it and just be a good person and you know treat people with dignity and respect and and um you know i i'm very very grateful for all the years in israel and um, proud to be an Israeli and proud to be an American. So you split time between both countries. Are you married and have kids? I, I don't have kids. I am married. Um, this July will be our uh, fifth uh, anniversary. So okay. Well, congratulations. We'll thank you. Thank you. Time flies. It does. Uh, it's wild to think how fast five years has already flown by. But um, what does your wife cool. think about bouncing back and forth like that? And she is so supportive in, in just okay. every aspect of life. I mean, for my, I just, I'm so lucky. Um, and she understands the importance. Uh, a small example, just last year during during the operation when rockets were raining down, and she was the one that pushed me to go to Israel to be with my colleagues and and my fellow first responders, and says, yeah, you like, yeah, I need to be there, right? And she was okay with that. Like otherwise, I don't, I don't know. Even why I know wives for a fact that even in Israel, their husbands didn't let them go, you know, was just, there wasn't like a big insurance policy that she put out on no. you. Like that. <laughs> okay. Just double check it. So brave and so courageous herself and, and, and loves this country so much and, and loves Israel. And like, just, you know, she comes from a family also of just a family that understands the responsibility mm. and um, what it takes to fight for your country and for, American values and for and for, for values of Western civilization, um, right. and to fight evil and to to protect your country from evil, and um, she is so supportive and I'm very very grateful for that. Great, well I think this would be a good spot to end. Where can people find out more about your work and you as a person, all that kind of stuff? Uh, please visit www israelrescue.org that's israelrescue.org it's a non-profit 501c3 organization tax deductible all of our volunteers respond on just donations 
Um, that, that is literally what keeps us afloat. And um, we would love to get a 90 second response time throughout the entire country. And that is one of our goals. So we're constantly training new medics to volunteer with us. And with that, we're also able to respond internationally, uh, just like we were in Surfside, Miami, mm -hmm. and in Florida, and during Hurricane Harvey, and Houston, or Hurricane Irma, and all over the world, Nepal. Um, we're, we're just on the front lines to help save lives um, every day. And it really means a lot where people join us. And, and you, when you volunteer, or you sponsor something, you get emails, updates of you get to meet your medic. There's just, a, just all, it's all good, right? I can't right. say anything bad about it. It's just all pros because you're literally donating to a cause that is so transparent and really helps uh, make the world a better place and do what we all really, really do best. And I think we all want to help save lives. Outstanding. I will put a link to that in the show notes. So if people want to donate, that'd be great. Okay. I think that's it for now. Thank you so much for being on the show, Gabby. It was great getting to know you and yeah, you, you got a great story to tell. So get cracking on that book, mister. <laughs> you got it. Well, if I get it done, you'll be the first, uh, the first podcast or interview. <laughs> Outstanding. I will be more than happy to. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.